Hey, it's Rob Jigula. I've been promising for some time an episode on our vehicle and vehicle setup. So, here it is. So why this vehicle? Why a Toyota Land Cruiser 80 Series and this one in particular, which is a turbo diesel VX? We want a vehicle that is comfortable a lot of the time you are in the vehicle driving around, especially if you're in a national park, for example. So you want to be comfortable. We want a vehicle that's capable. So that means a four wheel drive with good clearance and a couple of other features, which I might speak to a bit later. It's got to be easily repairable and preferably anywhere that we go, we should be able to find spares and that sort of thing for the car. And that's particularly significant if you're overlanding in Africa and Toyotas are particularly prolific through the African continent. The vehicle needs to take some abuse. So we want to drive in places that people don't normally drive. So bush rash, for example, driving over extended lengths of gravel road, driving through a bit of water and mud and so on now and then. And for that reason, a slightly older vehicle, so we're not so worried about the paint and how pretty it looks. And we don't like to have a trailer or a caravan. We want to kind of stay self-contained and, and quite mobile. So it's got to have a reasonable amount of packing space as well. So what do you need in an overland vehicle? Well, that's an episode on its own and we probably will get to one eventually. But I think a couple of key things here. Number one is clearance. Decent clearance will get you to, I think, 80% of the places that you could possibly want to go, even if you don't have four wheel drive. Number two is four wheel drive, if you can have it. If you've got four wheel drive and you've got good clearance, you're probably gonna get to 90 or 95% of the places that you could reasonably want to go to. Reasonable tires as well, or good tires, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And if you really wanna go all the way, then diff lock. So this vehicle has a center diff lock, rear diff lock, and front diff lock. I mean, that's basically the ultimate in four by four in. Three mechanical diff locks. You can't get better than that with respect to four wheel drive. This is a 12,000 pound witch, which is about 5.5, 5.4 tons in metric. The winch is nice to have. It's not often that you're going to need a winch. In fact, we've never used the winch. It's good to be able to recover yourself. So in some of those places we went to in Zimbabwe in December, that was during the rainy season. And it's quite possible you can get caught in mud there. So it's nice that there's trees that you can winch off. We're going to Botswana as well soon in the rainy season as well. So the winch might come in handy there. It's also a very handy piece of kit to have to rescue somebody else. So not a necessity, but really something that's good to have and something that gives some comfort and peace of mind when you're traveling in remote places. Originally, we had a steel winch rope, which we replaced with a synthetic rope. It's a lot safer. If something snaps in the winch train or the rope snaps, you're much less likely to get injured if you have a synthetic rope. And that's particularly important because this winch has a cable to run the winch. It's not a remote controlled winch. So you've got to be standing relatively close to the winch when you're winching. Bulba, also nice to have. You know, I think a bulba is good if you're going to bump into something. So, you know, try not to bump into things. <laughs> the bulba does provide some protection from damage to the front of the vehicle and a bit of the bodywork as well. If you're traveling on an old track where there's little trees and stuff growing on it because there hasn't been a lot of maintenance. And of course, traveling in Africa, especially if you're traveling at night, there's a possibility of coming across livestock, goats and donkeys and that sort of thing. And that, of course, will protect the radiator in particular if you have a collision and the bodywork of the car and possibly prevent a smaller animal from going up into the air and, and hitting the windscreen as well. But the primary thing is to not put yourself in that situation. If you are in that situation, then to drive carefully so that you don't get into a situation that's dangerous. Spotlights. As you can see, we don't have spotlights. We did have spotlights. We had two spotlights there. We never used them. And I would rather have the airflow available to the radiator than have the spotlights there. I don't really know what the point is of having spotlights. They look nice on the vehicle but we've never really had a practical use for them and we try not to drive at night in any case. So, yeah, we took the spotlights off. The vehicle has a bash plate. That's really nice to have, especially if you're driving on roads where you've got a very high middle money key. 
there is the possibility then of hitting that sand and you want to have that bash plate there to protect your sump to protect some of the inner workings of the engine but the sump in particular so the bash plate is really nice to have and it does give you a sense of safety as well if you're traveling over rocky road for example so you'll hit the bash plate and then you stop and you won't damage your engine you'd rather hit the bash plate than hit your something you know inside your engine or your suspension and then stop you want to do that on the bash plate so the bash plate is really nice to have gives a lot of peace of mind of course it's important to be able to recover your vehicle and so for that reason we've got a set of recovery points that are connected directly to the chassis and we've also got high lift jack points so you can lift the vehicle with a high lift jack those recovery points and high lift jack points are on the front of the vehicle as well as on the rear of course the recovery points not only about recovering yourself if you're going to recover somebody else then you also want to have a set of recovery points of course if you're going to go everywhere and see everything then occasionally you may need to be recovered and occasionally you may need to recover somebody else the vehicle also has a snorkel the snorkel is good for dust more than for scuba diving and don't take your vehicle into deep river crossings if you don't have to. It's nice to have the snorkel in case we get into such a situation. It should definitely be the exception and not the rule. The thing about going into water with the vehicle is that you start to affect other things like your alternator with mud and grit in your starter and the electrics and so on. So it's not ideal. And also you rapidly cool the engine when you hit that water. So from its operating temperature, and so you've got this big hunk of metal that's suddenly contracting as it cools down. So it's not ideal to be driving through deep, through deep water. But if you have to, then the snorkel is an important thing to have. It massively increases your wading depth, especially with a car like this that's almost entirely mechanical. Not a lot of clever electrics and electronics going on in this vehicle. But yeah, dust-wise, the thing is that your air intake is quite elevated. A lot of the dust from vehicles in front of you especially is often the highest concentration can be quite low down closer to the ground so this reduces the dust load on your filtration system okay what's under the hood of this beast what's not under the hood is a set of working shocks so that's something that's got to be replaced but we have our trusty aluminium stand here that comes out of a clothing cupboard so fit for purpose this vehicle has a 4.2 liter turbo diesel engine straight six with a total power generation capacity of about 140 kilowatts which isn't much for a 4.2 liter turbo diesel but it gets the job done completely factory nothing changed on the engine no increases in boost no bigger turbos nothing nothing no chipping because there's nothing that you can chip it's an almost entirely mechanical car and that is a 1hdt toyota engine we have two fuel filters in series one of which has a water eliminator the first one has a water eliminator it's a great thing to have if you're driving to places where you're not sure about the fuel quality the more remote places you go especially the more remote places you go as you go up into Africa the greater the likelihood of coming across fuel that's not of necessarily the best quality in front of the radiator is a smaller radiator and that is for cooling the transmission fluid these vehicles the automatic versions are quite notorious for that transmission system heating up and so it's a good idea to have a cooler for your transmission fluid that increases the longevity of your transmission fluid and in so doing of course also protects your transmission system now this is an old engine this is the very first engine in this series the 1hdt that came out with these vehicles so going back to about 1990 it uses a lot of fuel it uses a lot of oil it smokes a lot which i don't like but it starts every single time with one kick with one exception which was when we were driving up to the blader or down to the blader river valley in which case we had a leak on one of the fuel lines and so it wasn't starting with one kick but that is the only exception 
and a very basic problem which was solved in situ with a lot of help from some very good people that were willing to lend us a hand and then eventually just by changing that fuel pipe. This is a workhorse, reliable engine, should go for a long time, probably due for an overhaul at some stage judging from the amount of smoke that's coming out of the exhaust but otherwise a good solid reliable mechanical engine. Tires. We have all-terrain tires. Now you could argue that different types of tires might be a bit more suitable. Truthfully, a lot of the driving we do is on tar road and then we get onto dirt road. So it's very seldom that you need anything more than an all-terrain tire. Now you could occasionally want to have a mud terrain tire on the vehicle, but that's going to be 1% of the time, to be honest. Mud terrain tires, of course, a much more aggressive tread and so on, but it also comes with a lot more noise when you're driving on the highway, decreased road handling as well. It's not as comfortable because it's not as pliable as one of these tires. So this is definitely for us the preferred way to go an all-terrain tire. In addition to that, bang for buck, you know, value for money, I don't think you can beat an all-terrain tire for the type of things that we are doing. So these are 265, 75, 15, very much stock standard tires that would come with a vehicle like this or that you would use on a vehicle like this here. Nice big profile, of course, so that you can let the tire down, get a nice long footprint for better traction, specifically in sand and often in mud as well. The original Toyota rims as well that would have come with this vehicle when it was manufactured. We also have two spare tires. One spare tire that is on the back of the vehicle and one spare tire that is on the roof rack. You don't need two spare tires, but it's nice to have two spare tires. Gives you a lot of peace of mind, especially when you're going to remote places where you can't easily go and exchange a tire. Now there's two things about that. The one is that you can lose a tire and still have a spare tire, which is important. And secondly, you don't want to spend your time going to replace the tire. That means you've got to go to a town, stop, change the tire, buy a tire, the tires must come off the car, put another tire on the rim, it must be balanced and bloody bloody blah. Lots of time wasted that you would rather spend out on your road trip. That's another good reason for having two spare wheels. So I definitely recommend regardless of what vehicle you have, if you're going to be going on overlanding type trips and have suitable tires, preferably something with a good profile. I know a lot of SUVs now come with very low profile tires which are great for road handling. They look nice of course, but they're often not very practical especially in sand and mud and they're not very comfortable on gravel whereas you can reduce the pressure on this and have a much more comfortable ride over a gravel road. On our roof rack we also have an awning. This is an awning that just comes straight out of the vehicle and then it's got to be tied down in a couple of props that are part of the whole setup over there which is good it's nice to have an awning especially on a hot summer day like today when you want to be able to sit in the shade of the car or if it's raining and you want to be outside and you've got some protection i would recommend personally that you get a batwing awning it's a lot nicer gives you a lot more shade it's a lot easier as well to take out and put back in so probably at some point in the future we'll replace this with a batwing awning so it's pretty good it does what it's supposed to do it rattles a lot very noisy so that's not nice but and you probably hear that on some of the episodes when we're going over gravel roads a lot of rattling in the background this is the cause of that rattling so you are definitely a batwing awning with a canvas cover would be nicer probably a lot quieter too i have no idea how old this awning is it came with the car when we bought the car so might be as old as the car itself <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things on this vehicle might be as old as the car itself. Two jerry cans on the roof rack that gives us another 40 liters. Now when you have a vehicle like this that does 15 to 20 liters per 100 kilometers then even with a 150 liter long range fuel tank you still don't get very far. So it's nice to have an extra 40 liters for peace of mind. This is not really about extending range, it's more about peace of mind and having that fuel backup when we need it. Of course, because they're on the roof rack, they're quite difficult to get down. So maybe a better mounting place would be somewhere in the back of the vehicle, but you really have a bit of stuff on the back of the vehicle. So the roof rack kind of works and you only really need to get them down once in a while and you only need to fill them up once in a while. So it's pretty okay to be on top of the roof rack. The windshield up here is 
I don't know, you know, we bought the car with the roof rack and the windshield on it. It's nice to have because it protects stuff that's on the roof rack. So it protects the tent in particular. It's probably the most vulnerable thing up there. And obviously the spare wheel and to an extent the jerry cans as well. So it's nice to have that up there. In terms of actually reducing the amount of wind resistance, yeah, this is pretty much a brick of a vehicle in any case. So <laughs> it's about as streamlined as two bricks sitting on top of each other. So nice to have and does give protection, doesn't really change the dynamics or aerodynamics of the vehicle very much. Now you wouldn't think it, but this is one of the more significant reasons for getting this particular vehicle and that it's got a tailgate. So a tailgate is something you use a lot of the time. You can make food here, you bring stuff down from inside the car, you put it here. When you're doing stuff, you do stuff on here. You can step on here to get onto the roof rack or to bring the rooftop tent down. It's a really good space to have. I haven't changed anything on this car really, except putting a steel or aluminium plate actually on top of this tailgate to make it a better surface, more practical surface to use. So really nice to have. And it's one of the reasons that we went for this car as well, as opposed to a Nissan Patrol, for example, it's also a great car, but it has barn doors. If you've got a 70 series, it also has barn doors. So having a tailgate is really, it's a very practical piece of equipment to have on the vehicle. Draw system. We do not have a draw system in our previous vehicle, which is the Nissan Lavina or the Awesome Bar, as we like to call it. And this has changed our lives actually in terms of the practicality of packing and how quickly you can pack stuff because you don't have to pack things in order because you've got a drawer system. You can pack stuff in here and you can pack stuff on top there or you can pack it there first. It doesn't matter. Whereas if you don't have a drawer system, then you've got to be kind of careful about how you pack stuff and stuff that goes at the bottom, stuff that goes at the top must be able to sit on stuff that goes at the bottom and so on. So drawer system is great. This particular system I really like. So what do I like about this? Number one, is that there's a fridge slide so fridge on there easy to take the fridge in and out easy to access the fridge as well they are fancier ones that have a lever that come down which is nice as well for my significant other that would make it a bit more accessible for her for example from a height point of view a big drawer over here now the big drawer is pretty much the length of the drawer system as well so you can pack quite a bit of stuff in here now, I know a lot of people would pack their rescue gear and yeah, their recovery gear. We don't do it that way. We have our recovery gear in an ammo box up there. Reason for that is that we use this a lot more. We use this every single time. Whereas your rescue kit, you're not going to use every single trip. If, if 5%, 1% of your trips. So it's a space that we want to use often and must be easily accessible. So we put pots and pans and spices and all kinds of things in here that we would use for cooking, for eating, etc. It's a very good space to have. We call it the kitchen drawer. And then we've got a set of ammo boxes in here. Also very nice to have. And the great thing about ammo boxes and the separate drawer and the separate shelf, again, is that you can separate stuff. So in our ammo box here, first ammo box is typically our veggie box. So in here we keep onions and potatoes and lemons and things that don't have to be refrigerated but are food things vegetables that sort of thing and they must stay separate from stuff that could potentially contaminate them so onions potatoes lemons etc oranges we also keep the lid off of this because we don't want to close it and then get a whole lot of moisture in there that's going to result in some of those things going bad so it works really well next ammo box this is our charcoal box. So we fill this up with charcoal. And again, because it's easily accessible. So when you do a braai, build a fire, you come in here, take your charcoal out, go and use it, put it back in here, slots in there very nicely. It's closed so you don't have charcoal dust going all over the place when you're going over rutted roads and so on. The one negative, of course, is that because you've got a solid box, when you're going over rutted roads and stuff is jumping around, then it does tend to make your friable coal uh, a bit dusty and break it into smaller particles, but it works really well too. We do have a plastic liner bag in there as well, so just a black plastic bag, and that of course contains the dust and makes it easy to pull everything out, 
when you want to replace stuff in the box without getting a whole lot of dirt and dust all over the show. Now, another thing that I like is having a shelf. So you could have a drawer system that goes all the way to the top, but drawers do reduce to some extent the volume that you have to store stuff. And having a shelf, an open shelf like this is nice because then you can store a whole lot of stuff on top of here. So we put our tent over there. We put our bry, Weber bry that we carry around with us whenever we go overlanding. And we've also got our rescue kit and our gas stove on top of there. That's a good bit of space. If it was drawers all the way to the top, then you lose, you can't pack as much because obviously the drawers and the dividers, etc. take up space. Also, you can't really have a big enough drawer for a tent like this. So it's difficult to have one. So you might then have to pack your tent in a drawer without the cover. I prefer it like this. It's easier to carry the tent out of the car as well because it's in a bag. We have a set of fastening ropes here too. So those join onto a set of loops on the other side of the drawer system. And so we can fasten things down. So you can see here, for example, that our rescue kit along with the small toolbox is also fastened down as well as our fire extinguisher. We have two fire extinguishers in the car, one at the back and one at the front for obvious reasons. You don't know where fire is going to happen. You don't know where you're going to be standing or where you're at at the time. So you want to be able to very quickly access one of these and therefore having one in the front and one at the back makes it quick to access in almost all circumstances. Hold up for the gas canister. That means that your gas canister is in a firm position. This is one of the heavier things in the vehicle. And in the case of having a crash, for example, or driving over rutted roads, this is one of the things that could fly around and potentially cause some damage or injury as well. So nice to have that held down in a specific position. It's also still accessible. So we can take the stove down, put the stove over here, connect it to the gas and make something really quickly, especially if you're on the road. So it's nice to have that located over there too. There are a couple of nooks and crannies behind there as well, where we keep our compressor and we also keep a second jack for jacking up the vehicle and we can put stuff in there as we need it as well. So it's a small space and it's accessible relatively easily too. We also generally keep our Weber chimney on there as well. It's a nice position. It just fits exactly into that spot as planned and you know manufactured. <laughs> this is our water tap for our water tank. So the water tanks behind the back seats or where the back seats would be and then you can access that from the back of the vehicle. Deep cycle battery over here. This is connected of course to the two engine batteries. Important thing here is you want to allow charge or have your setup such that your charge can run in that direction to those two batteries but not necessarily in the other direction because you don't want to drain those two batteries when you drain your deep cycle battery but you do want to be able to charge your two batteries from your deep cycle battery if you connect to solar for example which is why we've got this connector over here to connect our solar power to there. This is a nice little deep cycle battery case because it's got different options for your connectors on there so we can connect our CTEC charger into here as well if we want to charge this battery directly from mains power and we can do it from solar. On top of that we have loosely a three kilowatt inverter Nice to have a three kilowatt inverter because sometimes you want 220 volts to run whatever it is, especially charging stuff in the car while you're driving. And so that is not pinned down so that we can take it out and move it about and we can use it in other places, not just in the car. So that just fits on top of there. Might be better if it's a bit more secured, but it's really not an issue and it works pretty well. From our inverter as well, we've got a cable that runs through the vehicle out to the front so that you can connect stuff into there and normally it's for charging things like cell phones and cameras and that sort of stuff where you want a 220 volt supply. That's particularly important when all our campsites are off grid which has in some cases been the case for an entire trip. Like I was involved with a trip recently we had very little electricity on that trip. We have a set of nooks and crannies behind there as well and that's where I keep spare oil couple of spare tubes for the engine so water pipes and fuel hoses that sort of thing a bit of extra engine oil some brake fluid and just basics that you would need to keep the vehicle going generally nothing major and the intent of course is to have a reliable vehicle that you don't have to be a mechanic to be able to drive a couple of thousand kilometers rooftop tent great to have especially if you're just stopping over for one night relatively easy to take down and to put up again and in comparison to a ground tent, 
similar amount of time but you don't stash a lot of stuff in it like you do with the ground tent and you don't have a lot of stuff to then unpack as well and take down and so on so it is quicker in that respect because you have less stuff generally in the tent and it's got its mattress inside already note the orientation of the rooftop tent it comes down this way as opposed to sideways there's a very good reason for that number one is that when the tent is over here you've got a bit of shelter so you can still use your tailgate and have some shade or shelter from the rain if it makes sense under those circumstances and in addition to that because it comes over this way not sideways it takes up less space in your campsite as well so if you know a relatively narrow campsite which happens from time to time it's nice to have that extra space in addition to that there when it's over the back here you you have access to the vehicle whereas when it's over the side it can be a bit more difficult to access the side doors because you've got to open the door fully and in this case here we've also got our awning over here which opens out to the side so we'd have to have the rooftop tent open out to the other side tow edge we never tow a trailer but we can if we want to because we have a tow edge so it's nice if you want to use the car for something else so if you want to attach a trailer to the car for example to move stuff from one place to another then it's good to have the tow edge in terms of off-road capability of course we have a full-time four-wheel drive vehicle we've got three diff lock center diff lock back diff lock and front diff lock or rear diff lock and front diff lock which is pretty much all you can have in terms of diff locks mechanical diff locks and that is extremely useful it's great that they're mechanical so you can use them under any circumstances you're not dependent on the vehicle making decisions for you you're not having the wheels have to spin before the vehicle realizes you've lost traction so mechanical diff lock is great in that respect and of course solid axles as well that comes with that so that's good the vehicle's got very good clearance as well i think if you're going to buy a 4x4 like a land cruiser typically stock standard clearance is sufficient for that vehicle in addition to that low range of course this is a proper 4x4 with low range have it's essential in some circumstances we hardly ever use the true 4x4 capability of this vehicle we hardly ever use more than just the center diff lock we rarely use the low range although we do from time to time especially on steep descents if you're out on a track that has a steep descent especially on gravel for example or if you've got a steep ascent then low range comes in handy or if you want to rescue somebody but we almost never use the full capability of the vehicle but it's nice to have that capability there so that we feel confident to go anywhere and see everything with our roof rack comes a table so you pull the table out and use it on the campsite table is i think one of the essential camping things a lot of places you'll go to will not have a build table or a table available so we heard matamba filming this we're filming on location one of our favorite places to camp and although they have everything else here they don't have tables so bringing your own table here is kind of essential and in this case it automatically comes wherever we go because it's in the roof rack there's also a ladder up here and that ladder is for accessing the roof rack what's nice about this about having a roof rack with an integrated table and ladder is that it takes up no space inside the car whereas you'd normally have to carry those in the vehicle so it gives you a bit more packing space and because the table is a large thing it improves your flexibility packing wise too two jerry cans on top and it's also great to have a second spare wheel we could have two spare wheels on two arms at the back but that would be a bespoke system this is the original system that comes with the toyota land cruiser it would mean taking this off taking the bumper off putting on a bumper suited to that with two swing arms that also puts a bit more weight on the back of the vehicle which is a little bit problematic because a lot of the weight is already on the back of the vehicle so we want to reduce that as much as possible a little bit more difficult to get to when it's on the roof rack and these are relatively heavy sets of tires as well to have to take up and bring down but it's still you know you hardly use it and when you do need to it's, it's really not very long to go up there we also have of course a very cool little system for inflating the tire and that is attached to the roof rack so you can inflate the tire from outside of the car you don't have to go on top of the roof rack in order to inflate the tire would i change the ladder i'm not 100 percent sure a telescopic ladder is actually quite nice to have because you can put your telescopic ladder anywhere on the car whereas with this ladder you're a bit more restricted as to where you can put it on the car and there is a position on the roof rack specifically to clip the ladder in telescopic ladder might be a bit more usable but more convenient in that respect but then you would also have to pack it somewhere 
nah, you could pack it on the roof rack as well, but then you'd have to get up to it to get it down. So telescopic ladder could work, but then you should take a bit more space inside the car. Our most important piece of rescue kit is a shovel. This is something that you must have. You will need to dig yourself out of places much more frequently than you will need to winch yourself out of places. And in, of course, to winch yourself out of places, you often need to dig yourself out first. So this is our most important piece of rescue gear and it stays on the roof rack. What's inside? <laughs> What's not inside? There are no back seats in the vehicle because we've taken those out so that we can have a bit more space to pack stuff and to pack stuff easily as well. The original setup of a Land Cruiser like this, so 80 Series VX, is to have three rows of seats. This car had two rows of seats and then the drawer system. We've taken out the back seats as well. So now we've got a big open space here where we can put a whole lot of stuff like our bags and so on. In addition to that, we've got the water tank over here and the water tank is attached to the drawer system. It's not permanently fixed. It's attached by a set of ratchet straps. And the reason for that is so we can easily take it out also. So you need to empty it out completely from time to time. You need to wash the inside of it and disinfect it and just take the reasonable precautions. It is water that you're going to use for drinking. So you can take it out quite easily, wash it out, dry it, rinse it, wash it out, dry it, rinse it, dry it again, and whatever else you want to do before you put it back inside the vehicle and ratchet it down again. What's in the front? Two seats with seat covers. Good idea to have seat covers. The seats under these seat covers actually look almost brand new because they've obviously been on here for a very long time and they have saved those seats. And it's good to have something sacrificial to take the pounding from jumping in and out of the car. In fact, our front driver seat here does need to be replaced or the seat cover needs to be replaced because it's, you know, we've done a few kilometers on this vehicle jumping in and out. Very nice to have. Slightly, not entirely waterproof, sort of semi-waterproof as well. So from time to time, you can spill things on it like your tea, for example, when you go over bumps and it, it doesn't go into the seat, which is nice. And then we've also got on the dashboard a dash cover with pockets. And those pockets are a nice little storage area for stuff. So we put the bird book in there, the tree book in there. There's little bits and bobs, like a little spanner that I use for taking off the tire pressure monitoring system. There's a couple of bolts and loose pieces in there that are nice to have as well. The vehicle has an automatic transmission. I much prefer automatic over manual. That automatic for the last sort of three vehicles that I've had, and I will never go back to manual. Automatic is just so much easier whether you're doing long distances or you're driving in town in peak traffic, whatever the case is, an automatic is the way to go. It's just a lot easier. So automatic's great, especially when you're driving at low speeds. You don't have to worry about changing gears. When you're overtaking, you don't have to worry about changing gears. You can if you want to, of course. One, of, or one or two of the small disadvantages that an automatic has over a manual. Firstly, if you have a stall on a steep hill, going uphill, it's difficult to recover with an automatic, easier with the manual. Secondly, when you're going downhill and you're trying to use the engine to brake in the lowest gear that you can have, you get a, a slightly lower speed with a manual than with an automatic. So you've got a little bit of slip on the automatic box and it does go a little bit quicker downhill than I would like sometimes in low range, but 90 9% of the 98% of 99% of the time we are driving in normal four range high on roads we're not using low range and whether you have an automatic or a manual doesn't matter so have the automatic because it's easier so definitely an automatic my preference what is this this is a Duerus a couple of people have asked about this my significant other got that for me this is great so when you're driving you've got a place to put your arm and look cool as you flash by the wildlife and they check you out and they're like yeah that guy's really cool and also you can put stuff in there like your credit card or your petro card for example when you stop at the toll gates easy you can put your receipts in there and so on and so forth really nice little piece of kit to have i highly recommend it and last but not least i keep a couple of basic tools and stuff inside of the little pockets here that are in the door so this is great you put a screwdriver in here that has multiple screwdriver thingies different sizes and stars and flats and all that sort of stuff very technical of course cable ties tire pressure monitoring couple of uh, ski ropes and and basic things as well and 
that is basically the stuff that we have inside of the car. We have a sunroof. Why? Because we have a roof rack with the tent. So the sun never comes in, but the sunroof is a good way for hot air to be vented out of the vehicle. So when we're in a hot place, keep the sunroof open generally when we're not moving to get the hot air to vent out easily, especially at night when we go to sleep and we want the fridge, for example, to have a relatively cool environment to, to keep on running efficiently. So there's a sunroof, it's a, yeah, could do with it, could do without, it doesn't really matter. Of course, if it drains, you don't want to leave the sunroof open. You also don't want to leave your sunroof open too wide because monkeys, baboons, my significant other says snakes, but um, yeah, I don't know about snakes. But anyway, don't leave your sunroof too widely open all the time. So I hear you ask, how about solar? We do have solar. We have a solar blanket. There's a good reason we have a solar blanket. Having fixed solar panels comes with a few difficulties or inflexibilities. Number one is it takes up space in the vehicle if it's something that you are going to carry. Whereas a solar blanket folds into a fairly small piece of kit. If you attach it to the vehicle, like to the roof rack, for example, then it takes up that space on the roof rack. Also, the solar blanket is kind of easy to use on the windshield. It's a great place to put it because then it shields the car from the sun going into the wheel shield while also generate electricity. So we have a solar blanket, it's a bit more expensive, takes up a lot less space and it's generally easier to move around and put wherever you want to put it. So we do have a solar kit and when we're off grid camping in particular, it's really nice to have that for recharging our deep cycle battery. And the deep cycle battery runs the fridge and the fridge keeps the beers cold. So solar, essential. Having solar as well means that we can go off grid for extended periods of time and we can park in a camp without necessarily driving around to recharge deep cycle battery. So going to Botswana, like we've planned now for our next big trip, means we can go to a remote place in Botswana where there is no electricity and we can stay there for periods of time without having to worry about electricity supply. That's it basically about our vehicle. What don't we have? We don't have a high lift jack. We could have a high lift jack, it could come in handy from time to time, but it's also, I think sometimes unsafe if you don't use it properly. So that's a little bit of a concern with a high lift jack and my significant other in particular doesn't want us to have a high lift jack. So we don't have a high lift jack. We don't have Bluetooth stuff, so we don't connect the fridge to Bluetooth. We don't connect the tire pressure monitoring system to Bluetooth and all that because it's distracting. You don't want to be sitting there with your cell phone and continuously looking at stuff or wanting to look at stuff because you have it available on Bluetooth. Obviously, it's good to know if the tire is going, but that's why we have a little screen for the tire pressures there, which you can look at at any time while you're driving. We also have these little gauges here for our different batteries. So for the two batteries in the front, we have inside the cab and for the deep cycle battery, we have one in the back. So we can at any time see what the situation is with the batteries. What could we improve? Fuel consumption. <laughs> yeah, if you have any ideas of fuel consumption, I'd love to hear them. But uh, fuel consumption, you know, that's kind of what comes uh, with a vehicle like this. It's going to be heavy unless you have a very modern vehicle with a more modern engine. And then, you know, the negatives that come with that come with that as well. This is a bush vehicle. We want to go out in the bush, go everywhere and see anything. It'd be great to have a bit more overtaking power. A lot of the time you're driving on roads, sometimes single lane, so often single lane. So being able to overtake a bit better, faster, would be nice, especially on the uphills. A remote for the winch, but that would mean replacing the winch with something more modern that you have a remote control winch, a wireless winch. So that'd be nice because then you don't have to stand close to the winch while you're winching. Having said that, of course, having a synthetic rope does make it a lot safer. So. Would we buy this vehicle again? Yes, we, we would. It is a great vehicle in that it's got three diff locks. It's got solid axles. It's got great clearance. It's got gate travel on the wheels. It's got great four by four capability. It's a solid vehicle. It's very reliable. It's a very reliable engine. It's a bush car that we can take out into the bush, but at the same time, it's very comfortable inside as well. It's got a reasonable amount of packing space. The only thing that would be better than this is a 
Land Cruiser 105, for example, with the same capabilities or with three diff locks, um, automatic diesel. Of course, there's a, a lot better fuel consumption on a newer engine, so a 1HDFT or a 1HDFTE, which would come with a later series, 80 series Land Cruiser or with the 105, for example. But other than that, there, it's a fantastic vehicle, great kit. It really suits our needs and I feel good driving this vehicle. I feel like I can go anywhere. I feel like I can do stuff without any worry or concerns about reliability, whatever the case might be. Do you need an overlanding setup like this to overland? No, you don't. There's a lot of stuff here that's nice to have. There's a lot of stuff that you can do without and still overland and have a great time. If you've got good clearance on the vehicle, you will go to most places that you can possibly want to go to. Add a four wheel drive system, doesn't have to be four by four and low range and diff locks and fancy stuff like that. And you go to 95% of the places that you could ever really want to reasonably go to. And then add the other stuff that we have in that makes packing easier, like the shelving system, and a fridge is really nice to have, and a bit of solar is nice to have, and a water tank is nice to have, and, 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 and a rooftop tent. All of those things are great to have, but you don't need them. They're not essential for overlanding. They just make it a lot more pleasant, a lot more comfortable, a lot easier. And you know this because we did over 15,000 kilometers in a Nissan Levina station wagon, which is basically a city sedan. 180 millimeters of clearance, which is quite decent for a city vehicle. No 4x4 front wheel drive, small little 15 inch wheels that you couldn't deflate and stuff like that. And we went to many places and we had fantastic experiences. We did a lot of Namibia, we did a lot of the Northern Cape, we did some of the West Coast and it worked out. And you don't need a fancy 4x4 to go overlanding and, and we've done that and we've started there before we came here but this does make it a lot easier a lot more comfortable and a lot more peace of mind when you go to some places so if you found that informative i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learned something from it i hope this helps you with your overlanding setup if you're going to set up a vehicle if you want to add stuff to your vehicle or if you want to subtract stuff from your vehicle as well and hit the like button give me some feedback some comments questions if you have any questions always great to hear back from you guys i love that interaction with you and until the next episode go everywhere see everything subscribe and have a great time <laughs> cool <laughs> okay